Hello, everybody. Mr. Trump? Yes. Pleasure to have oh, you what here. What a nice turnout. Such I'm going to ask you some questions, if that's okay, that's okay, in a nice, friendly Iowa way. Okay. You know, you okay. got lucky here on the weather we have. We have beautiful weather. I've been here many times, actually, and it's a great place. Greatest farmland in the world, I would say, right? Yeah. Do you? It really is. I mean, it's amazing. Well, you're a positive guy. Right. But you also have been in the real estate business from an early age. Right. And I wonder if we could ask you a few questions. Uh, I'm a feel, bit more comfortable right now than I was a year ago when T. Boone Pickens was sitting uh, in the same seat as you are. Right. But uh, I'd a, like... He's actually a friend of mine. He's a great guy. And last year he gave me the T. Boone, T. Boone Pickens Award for entrepreneurship. And he was really... Uh, he's a terrific guy. Although he invested a lot of money outside of oil. And he probably wished he didn't do that. Well, he told me that uh, in 2001 he had four billion dollars. He lost two, and he gave one away, and he was happier. Well, he might be happy. I wouldn't be happy. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> um, we're at a different uh, level than where you normally would invest, but you're a real estate guy, and I wonder if you could talk to us about perhaps what kind of real estate investments do you see would make the greatest returns in the years ahead? Well, certain cities are doing really well, Miami in particular in this country. I bought uh, Doral, which was uh, the group before me paid $550 million. The market turned very bad. This is seven, eight years ago. And then I bought it for about $150 million, and I, I fixed it. Now it's just opening as it'll be the finest resort of its kind anywhere in this country. And that was a great investment, but Miami is just hot. Uh, New York City is hot, Manhattan in particular, but New York City is very hot. Uh, there are certain other places, San Francisco. Uh, I know a lot about farmland, actually, relatively speaking, considering I'm not a farmer per se, although I've always liked that lifestyle. I gave a picture, and I, I actually have a picture of myself. Uh, I was nominated for an Emmy, and they asked if I would sing Green Acres, and they had me all dressed up in the overalls and the whole thing. And, it was, it was quite the fun, but... It didn't look really, really real. I know. Maybe it did. I'm not sure if it did or not. But uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of uh, farmland. I know it's gone down a little bit over the last period of time, but... Uh, and you were at your all-time high. When would you say that was, that the all-time high? Well, last year. Yeah. We've doubled much. since 2007. Right. Doubled, and then it's gone down a little bit. But I think it's a great investment. I think in places like Iowa, I think it's a great investment. Ultimately, it's going to be very strong. What kind of criteria do you set up if you have them on what's a good deal and what's not right. a good deal? Well, a lot of things I do, I do because I want to do them. And I don't necessarily say, oh, this is going to be the best return on investment. Uh, you know, the uh, ROI. They say ROI. A Wall Street firm would do ROI. I do something if I feel good about it, if I like it. Uh, I, I sort of have to love it, especially when it comes to real estate. I have to love it. And what happens with me more than anything else is I'll do things that I feel are, have a certain glamour, have a certain beauty to them. A location's very important. The concept of what you're going to do. I've done well with hotels, and I like hotels. We're building hotels all over the world, actually. Uh, but that uh, the concept of what you're doing, uh, the architecture is, to me, always very important. I mean, a lot of times it costs you less money to do good architecture. I have friends that and people, and enemies, that put up buildings, and they're really, enemies. I do a couple, but really <laughs> ugly buildings. And a good-looking building would have cost less money, but they don't have a certain aesthetic. So that's also very important. But you know, if you're in the right city and you have the right location in the right city, it's hard to fail. I'm not Jay Leno, but I want to ask you some serious questions okay. and some personal questions a bit in your business side. You are flamboyant, I think you might agree with that. And many people who are in the business you're in, or really are into business, are pretty reclusive as far as who they are. And I'm questioning why you've decided to put your name on your buildings and really be a public figure. Do you think it helps you as a real estate man? Well, I didn't do that purposely. It started pretty much, I did a lot of jobs without my name. People didn't know who I was. My father was a builder in Brooklyn mostly in Brooklyn and Queens, of middle-income housing. And I learned a lot from him in terms of negotiation, in terms of construction. I watched him as a little boy growing up doing uh, houses and doing uh, middle-income uh, jobs. 
and I, I really learned a lot, but I always wanted to go into Manhattan. And I think that um, it just happened. I, I named a building Trump Tower early in my career. And it was a tremendous location, 57th and 5th, right next to Tiffany. The best location. And when I bought the air rights over Tiffany, that's where I took all the air rights over Tiffany. I bought them, and I was able to add them on. And I don't know, you sort of have little things like that in other places. But uh, I bought the air rights over Tiffany, which was a great deal. And I added them onto Trump Tower. I ended up with a 68-story building. And it was from the day I, I conceived it, it was successful. What happened is when I bought the air rights, I had the right to name it Tiffany Tower. And I said to a friend of mine who's very streetwise, I said, let me ask you a question. If you wanted to call it Trump Tower, but you had the right to name it Tiffany Tower, which really at the time, because nobody knew too much about me, uh, would you do it? He said, when you change your name to Tiffany, call it Tiffany Tower. He was just a streetwise guy. And I said, okay. And I had this really valuable right, and I should have perhaps done it, but it worked out so well. So I called it Trump Tower, and that was a very, I was very well known before that, but, but that was something that was really on 57th and 5th, Trump Tower, and so successful. And then it sort of started from there. I, I did a lot of deals that worked out. Uh, some didn't work out, but you make them work out. A lot of times when you have a deal that doesn't work out, you have to make it work out. That's where you're really good, when the economy crashes and you know what to do. And I never went bankrupt. Many people went bankrupt in the early 90s. I never did, but, but I negotiated incredible deals. I mean, if you were a deal junkie, that was a great time to be. And now my company is uh, very, very big, much, much, much bigger than it ever was before. And I've had just a great time. I've had a, a lot of great experiences. How do you select what you brand as yours? Because Steve Brewer tells me there's a lot of things that you've branded with your name. How, how do you pick what's good and what's not? Well, I used to just take the really good ones. I'd put my name on, and I'd, I'd use it, and it would be fine. For the most part today, I only want to do deals where my name can go on it because it means it's sort of an ultimate thing. And the name has become to be known really as super quality, whether it's in construction or whether it's whatever I might do. And um, when I put the name on a building, for instance, I built the Grand Hyatt Hotel next to Grand Central Terminal. That was before I was using my name. And I called one of the restaurants Trumpets. That was sort of the beginning of things to come. And uh, it was a nice restaurant that I built within the Grand Hyatt. The Grand Hyatt was on 42nd Street. and. Park Avenue, Lexington Park, and it was good. It was a very successful job. And uh, I ended up selling that and really coming out great. And then I did other things after that. But I started putting my name on as, as the sites got really good and as I was able to be wealthy enough to buy the great locations. And today I have so many iconic sites. I mean, I just bought Turnbury in Scotland, which is one of the incredible places and the home of the Open Championship sometimes referred to as the British Open, but the, it's had four of them, and it'll have many more, and, and uh, we're doing a job there. I call it Trump Turnberry, and I did that with approval because I wanted to get the approval from the RNA, and they said absolutely. But um, when I do that, it's not an ego thing, it's a marketing thing, because I just get much higher pricing when I do it. I mean, it's, uh, over the years, it's meant a lot from a marketing. I've, I've bought many, many failed projects. Over the last 10 years, I've bought many failed projects that were in great locations and everything else. And I call it Trump. As an example, I bought, uh, I have 18 golf clubs, uh, not including Doral. And I call them Trump National Golf Club Philadelphia, or Trump National Golf Club Washington, D.C. And I, I'm convinced, they're all really successful. And I'm convinced that if I didn't call them Trump, I don't think, I'm not even sure that they would have been very successful. I recall several years ago, your name was coming up, and Billy Crystal, uh, the comedian, said, I think at the Academy Awards, he pointed you out and he said, Donald Trump riding through New York City, looking up at the building, saying, got it, got it, need yeah, it, true. got it, need it, need it. <laughs> need, that's true, need. Because we're sick, I mean, you know, you need, how much do we need? But. Uh, it's just fun. I mean, for me, it's fun. If you're not going to have a good time doing it, don't do it. I tell that to people all the time. I, I sometimes will make a speech where friends of mine ask me to make a speech about success and what it takes. And I always say you have to love what you're doing, and you really do. If you don't have a passion, I, I know the people in this room, I know a couple of you actually, and the passion you have for what you do is incredible. And I know Steve, and Steve, who put on this whole thing, and his passion with his wife, he came to New York to see me. and. I said, man, you're really passionate, aren't you? It's, it's easier when it's sold out or when you have standing room. If it was 50 people in here, maybe it wouldn't be as good. But Steve has tremendous passion. That's why he's so successful with his company. So 
I think that love and that passion is a very important element. Well, after all of you that you've done in the real estate business and getting higher and higher in effect, um, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but Iowa is going to have caucuses uh, in January of next year. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people come to Iowa just to kind of see what the, which way the wind's blowing, so to speak. True. And, and many of them never would say, you know, why they're here, but they would tell you perhaps maybe something of their political philosophy. Uh, which party are you a member of? I'm a Republican, I'm conservative, uh, quite conservative, and uh, I'm actually making a speech tomorrow, one of the speakers tomorrow, and I basically want to see America be great again. We're not great, we're, we're a debtor nation. We're gonna soon own, owe $20 trillion, much of it borrowed from China and other countries, and I would like to see our country be great again. We have tremendous potential. Uh, I just see uh, recently where China is building very quickly a super train, a, a high-speed railroad uh, between Beijing and Hong Kong. That's a seriously long trip, but they're going to do it in a rapid period of time. And we can't fix LaGuardia Airport. We can't fix our bridges. Just the other day in Ohio, a bridge fell down. We can't fix, uh, and they're really, I mean, if you look at the statistics on these bridges and things, they're really dangerous. Our infrastructure is falling apart. Our country is falling apart. Our military is not what it was. And I can tell you in real estate, I get every week I get a listing, some military bases for sale. We're selling all these military bases. And, you know, with what we're doing right now and with the world hating us so much, we should not be uh, knocking the military. We should be building it up. But just being in the real estate business, so many bases are being sold. I say, where, did this, where do they stay with all of this action? So uh, I'm making a speech. And, you know, basically, uh, you know, hopefully it's about competence and it's about you know, when they, when they do an Obamacare, which is terrible for people, terrible, and it's going to be ruinous to the country when it really kicks in in 16. It's really going to kick in. So the next president's going to get a real shocker. But there's much better plans that are much better for the people and much less expensive for the country, and they didn't uh, do that. But you look at what happened where they spent $5 billion on a website. Now, I have websites. We all have websites. And uh, I mean, I have websites that cost me nothing, and they're big websites. How do you spend $5 billion on a website? And by the way, then it didn't work on top of everything else. So the country is just fed up with it. And, and that's what I'm all about. We've been going through this conference today talking about the impact of various things, uh, weather and exports and government on agriculture. And some people are worried about the president over the next two years, and other people are worried about the Congress of what they may do and may not do that relates to business. One of them in his inheritance tax, another to be potentially the change in the capital gains tax, 1031 exchanges. Yeah. What's your biggest concern about the next two years in Washington? Well, I think a lot of bad things could happen on taxes. I mean, I know owning a farm, a lot of times you don't have great liquidity, but you have great value. And you pass it, you want to pass it on to your children, and they're making the inheritance laws much, much tougher. So that's something that's going to affect a lot of the people in this room. It's going to affect my family, too, because I have a lot of things that are, you know, very valuable, and it's going to affect everybody. But the inheritance taxes, if, assuming you want to leave it to your children and your family, which a lot of people do, especially farms, uh, they're making it very, very tough in terms of the inheritance tax. Uh, the 1031 laws and Section 1031, you know, that's all, I mean, that deferral is a very valuable thing, and a lot of people are saying that's going to be ended, deferring capital gains. Uh, they, as you know, you saw the other day, they want to raise the capital gains tax very substantially. They really want to raise it to a large extent. Essentially, they want to raise it also on inheritance. And a lot of bad things are happening with taxes. Now, whether or not get, that gets through Congress, I don't know. But uh, I've heard some of the Republicans saying certain things they sort of can live with. And, you know, I'm very disappointed because I'm a Republican and I'm a very conservative person. And I think that they're not negotiating very well with Obama. And I think they're not getting what they should be getting. But it's going to have a big effect on farms and a big effect on farmers and the farmer's family. If we look um, at you and what you hold as ideals, um, what president of the 20th century, early 21st, would you describe as the one that you admire the most? Well, the one I like the best is Ronald Reagan. I, I've always liked him. I knew him you know, relatively well. I was much younger, but I knew him quite well. I always helped him and supported him. He liked me. I actually have a nice picture of myself and Ronald Reagan, and it's one of my treasured pictures. 
I liked what he stood for. I liked his style. I liked how he represented the country. I remember once on Lincoln's birthday, uh, he was on Lincoln's day, he was uh, putting a wreath down in an area, and he just looked so presidential. He had, he had a great uh, manner, a great style. And, uh, you know, and his thought process was much more in tune to mine than certainly what you have today. Did you know he started in radio in this town? I had heard that, absolutely. Yeah. That's right. And he did okay, but he moved on quickly. Yeah, he wasn't as... <laughs> <laughs> so are you saying if a person stayed in radio their whole career, they're a failure? Well, I know a couple of... <laughs> I'll tell you. I know a couple of your radio guys here, and they're great. But uh, Ronald Reagan, he was here, and he, he was... He was, I heard he was terrific, and you know, he did move on, and who would have thought this was going to happen? You know, he wasn't, he was a successful actor, but he was sort of, they called him uh, a B actor. It turned out that he was an A actor. But he, you know, if you ask me uh, who was the guy, I would say it would be Ronald Reagan. For this upcoming time, either um, shiver or salute, who do you think will come forth as candidates? Let's go with the Democrat Party okay. first. Who might emerge? Well, I know all the players well, and so many of them come up to my office asking me for support and asking me to back them. Many of the people that you have here are, are asking me all the time, and I'm making my own decision. So, you know, I say it's a little bit early to do that, right? But um, I, if you look at the Democratic side, certainly it would be Hillary has, you know, got the big lead. And I don't know that that'll stay. Don't forget, she had the big lead a number of years ago when. Barack Obama took it away, and right. I would say it was almost equal. I think she's probably, in a way, stronger. Now, you have to ask about health, and you have to ask about physical, because it's a brutal, brutal period of time when you have to go through that. And then you have to ask yourself, did she do a good job as Secretary of State and other places? And a lot of people have very strong opinions about that. So I think she can absolutely be beaten. But I also, I do think from the primary standpoint, I think that she'll probably win. Uh, they have a couple of people running against her. Webb and O'Malley probably are running, uh, definitely. I think Elizabeth Warren would give her the toughest battle. But I think Hillary will probably get the nomination. And I think that, uh, you know, she'll be formidable. Uh, on the uh, Republican side, I mean, I've been very vocal. Uh, Mitt Romney was given a chance. He should have beaten Obama. He didn't. He did very poorly in the last month and a half, very, very poorly. I don't know what happened to him, but he did very poorly. A lot of people are very angry at him for that reason. I am. Uh, he did, uh, you know, he choked. Something happened. It's like a deal maker that can't make a deal. It's like a golfer that can't sink the three foot putt on the 18th hole. Something happened to him. I don't know what it was. And, you know, the 47% uh, comment, you know, that he doesn't care about 47% uh, was a bad comment. And, you know, that's not going away. Uh, he's got a lot of he's got a lot of problems, and if you remember when he lost his son, or somebody came out and made the statement that he really didn't want to be president, or never did anyone not try so much to be. And I'm saying, you know, that's not the kind of a that's the kind of a thing a deal maker might say because you feel better if you don't make the deal. So if Steve doesn't make a deal, you say a lot of times, yeah, I don't care. You tell your wife, I don't care. It doesn't matter because it makes it. But now when you're running for president, and not when you have that many people that wanted you to win. But he didn't get out the vote. John McCain actually had more people voting. Had he gotten the amount of votes that John McCain got, I think it would have been a, probably a different story. But so I, I just don't think he should be running. Uh, Bush, uh, you know, we've had enough Bushes. That's the way I look at it. I feel strongly about it. Other candidates, I like them all. I mean, I know most of them, and I like them all as people. Uh, as to whether or not that they can do a good job, maybe it's a little bit too early for me to be saying. But I, I do think that Romney has not earned his stripes, uh, because that was a race that, by the way, is much easier to have won than running against Hillary. In my opinion, running against a president who was doing a truly horrible job was a much easier race to win than running against uh, Hillary. Uh, so I think Romney should be disqualified, and I think that Bush, uh, I just think we've had it with the Bush family. What about Mr. Christie, just across the river from you? Well, I know him very well, and he's got some difficulties, as you know. And if he runs, he'll be formidable, too. And uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, he hasn't announced that he's running. But we'll really have to see. I mean, I like him. He's a friend of mine. But uh, we're going to have to see whether or not he runs. Here's a challenge and a frustration that I have, and it is that 
the candidates to get nominated have to move left a long way or right a long way. But yet, when we come to the general election, the people want to elect people who truly can go to Washington and govern. And it's, now we have quite a lot of people who are so resolute in their view that they can't move to the middle enough to truly govern, and they're on both sides. And sometimes, the Farm Bill this last year, the two sides, extremes, beat the middle. Right, that's true. Well, but you also can say that the Republicans really put up fairly moderate candidates the last number of times, and so moderate that they never got out the vote. And if they would have been more conservative, they, I think, would have actually done better. See, I happen to think that the country is much more conservative than people feel. I also think that the people that go out and vote are much more conservative than people feel. And Romney wasn't really that conservative. I have a lot of very conservative friends that they just didn't care about him. And if you look over the last number of years, certainly McCain wasn't that conservative. And uh, they've been putting out these moderate candidates who have not been winning. So, you know, a lot of people feel that, uh, I understand exactly what you say, but a lot of people feel if they really went with their true beliefs, they'd do better. And I happen to be among those people. In the year 1999, 2000, you flirted with running for president, and then you didn't. Can you tell us your thought process then? Well, I really looked at it the most last time, and I decided that I wouldn't do it. And I was, I'm building buildings all over the world. We're in Panama, we're in China, we're in all different places, uh, Great Britain and Scotland, and just so many different locations. Plus, I'm building a great one, uh, the old post office in Washington, D.C., right on Pennsylvania Avenue, right between the White House and Congress, which we started a few months ago, and it's going to be phenomenal. It's going to be the best hotel, one of the best hotels in the country. And I've received uh, the award for having the best hotel in North America, in Chicago, and a lot of great stuff. And I was in the midst of doing so much, so many things. And, you know, I'm not a politician where I can just say, oh, I like to run. These politicians, they can run. They have nothing else to do. It's true. <laughs> What do they do? I mean, if I don't want to use a name, but and I, he came up to my office and he was so nice and his daughter was so lovely. But Rick Santorum came up to my office recently and again, could not have been nicer, but so if he runs, he runs. It's not, if I run, I've got it. And all of them, every one of them, if they run, run. That's what they do. They run for office and then they screw you because they don't know what they're doing. Um, <laughs> but, but they don't have much to do. That's what they do. They're professional runners for office. With me, I have all over the world, on top of which, uh, you know, The Apprentice is such a great success, and it continues to be a great success. And uh, a problem was that The Apprentice was being aired during the last, I mean, right during that running season. Uh, it was on, and, you know, you have a contractual relationship, and because of the equal time laws, you're not allowed to run and have, otherwise Rick and everybody else running for office would have to have two hours of primetime television on NBC. Somehow, I don't think NBC would like that. And, you know, the laws, it's a very tough law, but if you have a show, you cannot run. So I had that, and I had, you know, but I had a massive amount. Now, uh, many of those jobs are very successful. They're up. My children have gotten older, and they're very capable. Uh, Don, Ivanka, and Eric, three of my five children. And they're in the business and doing really well, and they like it, and they, they really are doing well. And so I can do what I want to do. And The Apprentice, in another two weeks, actually, it's done so well that NBC just extended it for another week. They said, do you mind doing two hours of primetime television? Because it does so well, they want to extend it for two weeks. So they're actually doing that. You have a scoop, because it's just, it, All I, right. I don't think that's been announced yet. But they're actually uh, extending it for a period of two more shows. So. Um, you know, I've really had a lot of fun. And by the way, I just met Chris Souls, who's a nice guy. Where is Chris? He was, yeah, what he's a nice back here guy. somewhere. Hello, Chris. Look at him out there, handsome guy. <laughs> but what a nice guy he is. And he's doing wonderfully with The Bachelor. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I've had a lot of fun. But I love the country. I hate what's happening to the country. And uh, I may surprise a lot of people. All right, before we get there any further, but I would like to talk about Miss America pageant. Yeah. Did you do it because you felt sorry for them, or did you do it because it's promotional for you, or it's a moneymaker for you? Well, it's a Miss Universe pageant. It's the I'm biggest sorry, in the Universe. world, and it's Miss USA, Miss Universe. And uh, that's the one that has no talent. That's the one that has great beauty and less talent. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> that's why it gets better ratings. Yeah. <laughs> 
hard to some, get somebody who's a great concert pianist and also happens to be incredibly beautiful, you know, so it's one of those things. But we have, uh, the girls are fantastic. In fact, they're down now in Miami. Uh, it's going to be on uh, next week, uh, on actually this coming Sunday, and it's in Miami, and it's going to be a, a tremendous show, and the people, they're wonderful young people. I mean, they're people, it's very interesting, it's a whole different world unto itself, the pageant world. But the uh, young ladies work hard. And you know, uh, worldwide, it's one of the highest rated shows because you know the Miss Universe badge in itself. So it'll be exciting on Sunday night on NBC. It'll be very exciting. And uh, no, I, I bought it. It was a sick puppy, very, very sick. I probably bought it 15 years ago now. And over the years, I've made it better, better, better. And uh, it gets great ratings. And I, it's a very, very powerful uh, thing. And it, does, it makes a lot of money on top of everything else. Well, I had a couple of things I wanted to tell you here. One of them is that I'm getting married tomorrow. Wow. Yeah. Is that right? Congratulations. And so I wonder if I could call this Where is evening. your wife, by the way? She's, uh, she's, she's, she's in therapy. Uh, <laughs> and, and that she just came out from under the drugs. Right, that's uh, but I'm wondering if I could utilize the, the, the dinner this evening for my bachelor party and just Absolutely. tell everybody that Absolutely. Donald Trump is a bachelor I, party. I think that would be I love it. I sh I'm sure Steve wouldn't object to it. Yeah. yeah. But I and the other one is well, thank that's you. very nice. I'm pretty excited about it. You should the, be. The other you one better is, be. If you're not, we have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, last year when T. Boone Pickens was here, right. he brought his fiance with him. Oh, that's good. And that's right. uh, he uh, said that you know he was marrying her. He didn't tell us that she was the heiress to 1700 Chili's restaurants. Well, that helps. Doesn't help about her bed, does it? Her figure was in the bank. He'll get that four billion back, right? Slowly. Yeah, in some way. The old-fashioned way. My my other question is. is <laughs> my other question is somewhat personal, and I'm just wondering, you know, if you think hair makes the man. <laughs> I mean, look at me, and how far I've gone. I actually, you, I how, think you look very good, actually. You know, obviously your wife does, but uh, does it make the man? No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, it is my hair. You can, I think you can tell. Can I grab it and pull on it? Yeah, sure. You can do whatever. You it is. Okay, I'm going to do that. I combed it this way. <laughs> yeah, it is your hair. It is, I'm sorry, but no, it, no, no. It's he. He pulled it. He pulled it. <laughs> If it wasn't, yeah. it wouldn't be on right now. <laughs> but no, it doesn't. It's just, you know, it's funny. I, I take such abuse over me. Every once in a while, I'll get a tweet. Like, I have these millions of people. And every once in a while, I'll get a tweet where somebody will say, you have such beautiful hair. And I always retweet that one. But 99% <laughs> of them, it's, who's your barber? But it's sort of the way I've combed it for a long time. And, you know, I have so many friends where they don't have hair. I mean, it's, and it, does it matter? Absolutely not. Actually, some of the best businessmen that I know have very, very, and I almost say maybe it's a sign of being a great businessman, but you know, for asking me that question, you're fired. Oh. <laughs> well, my life is complete now. Your life is I can, I can marry, years. die, and go on <laughs> maybe to heaven. I wanted to tell you, though, that you are a wonderful real estate man, but you may not be the best in the world. There is an up-and-coming man who probably has done something, well, he has done something that I don't think you've done. He bought a golf course and turned it into a farm. Well, Have you ever done that? No, I haven't, actually. No? Yeah. It's a good and, idea, though. And <laughs> Got a lot of the good other one, kids. he's kind of quiet about it, but you see these terms brewery? Right. Steve Brewer owns right. all those breweries. That's right. his name. Well, he put his right. name up there in that case. That's so great. with that, would you please welcome to finish up the interview here that's great. with Thank Donald Trump, Steve Brewer. Thank you. And then one, one thing Ken didn't mention is that in addition to the bachelor party, I'm paying for his rehearsal dinner this evening. Ooh. That's really what Ken has up his sleeve. Very good. So. Good hey, job. Good job, Ken. Uh, you know, one of the questions that I've been asked probably uh, 50, 75 times today is why did Donald Trump accept your invitation to come to Iowa? Okay, well, I thought I'd be a little bit cute because I heard that you were going to ask me that question. That was one question I heard. And I said, I have to be truthful. And number one, I do love the area. I, do, I really do. It's a, an amazing, amazing people. 
And number two, he paid me a lot of money. <laughs> and I give it to charity. And if I didn't do it to charity, I wouldn't do it. But I give, I give the money that I make at these things to charity. And Steve was very generous, and he knew I was giving it to charity. Uh, and number three, I'm making a speech tomorrow. So the timing just all worked out great. And I love, essentially, real estate people. I mean, farmers are, you know, if you, a lot of people don't realize this, but farmers, in some cases, are great real estate people. I know farmers that have made a f massive fortune on their farms. And they've actually made more with the real estate than they have sometimes with the really hard work of farming. But, uh, so it's just an honor to be here. But Steve was very generous, and uh, a lot of money's going to a charity, and that's one of the reasons I'm here also. Yeah, and in addition to that, I think I bought three of your ties. Now. Well, that's good. Um, a couple books, that's a good. shirt, <laughs> a few cocktails that's in the Trump bar. That's right. Um, so uh, I'm helping you out more than you even realize. That's, uh, that's okay. <laughs> so, um, a question I had is uh, just uh, about Iowa and real estate, and and you've obviously been very successful in New York, Manhattan, and I'm curious what you would uh, think your life might look like had you been born in Iowa. And, and what, uh, you know, would you be a, a large farmer or what? Uh... I think I'd have the biggest farm, <laughs> the best farm. It would be the greatest. No, I, I think I would have a, you know, I think I would be very happy in Iowa. You know, if I were born here, uh, I was born in Queens, New York, and, and I always had a dream of going to Manhattan. I saw the big buildings, and I'd always tell my father, I want to go there, I want to go there. And, uh, you know, ultimately, I was able to do that at a pretty young age, actually. I was about 27 or 28 when I, I did the Grand Hyatt Hotel and, uh, and other things, the Convention Center. I renovated Grand Central Terminal. and I was doing a lot of things at a young age, below the age of 30. And, but, if I, but I was, you know, you're born into something. And so many times, people, they want to stay where they are, whether that's habit or, and in some cases, they shouldn't. I mean, I tell people, I mean, there are places I won't mention that are, just don't have much of a future. And people are born there, and they die there, and they don't do well because it's so hard. And, you know, it's so hard to make a buck. And uh, if, if it were here, I would say that I would absolutely have stayed, and I would have been, a, I think, hopefully a very successful farmer, maybe a big one. Um, you'd mentioned the Grand Hyatt Hotel. That was, was that your first real estate deal, or I, I Well, it I... was my first big one, and it, it wasn't my first deal. I did a lot of uh, middle-income housing, and then low-income housing, and uh, I did a lot of different housing. I did subsidized housing, which uh, was very nice, because I was building for people that really didn't have any money. So I did a lot of that. Nobody knows that, but I did a lot of that, and it was very successful. And then I just started coming in, and I, I always, again, wanted to go into Manhattan, and it was just something, uh, you know, that it was a dream for me to do. So when I built my first, uh, the Grand Hyatt was really my first big job in Manhattan. Then I was involved with the convention center. I convinced them to build a convention center in the right location. I was able to take an option on the land and get the state to build what's called the Jacob Javits Convention Center, which is one of the big ones. Uh, and they built it on the land, and that worked out great. And I did a lot of, a lot of deals, a lot of great deals, and, and a lot of fun doing them. Which, uh, which deal would you be most proud of, if you look back? Well, it's, it's interesting. I'm proud of all of them. But, you know, look, I'd have to say that the West Side Railroad Yards, uh, that's a massive job that I built on the west side of Manhattan from 72nd Street to 59th Street. And ultimately, was, we sold a big chunk of it for uh, $1.8 billion, almost $1.8 billion. That was a great one. The, um, uh, you know, Trump Tower is not my biggest deal, but it's, it's just been a great deal from the day I built it. Uh, I built many buildings in Manhattan, and, uh, you know, I'm proud of all of them. I'm very proud of uh, the jobs I did outside of, uh, outside of Manhattan and outside of New York, uh, including things that we're doing right now. I, I think that the old post office will be one of the great hotels of the world. It's this incredible building that's built in the 1880s with walls that are five foot thick of solid granite. You know, you could never build it again like that. And I'm taking that building, we just gutted it out, and we're rebuilding it as Trump International Hotel, Washington, D.C. And I think that's going to be, uh, it's not going to be my most profitable job, but it's, a, it's such a beautiful project. And it's, you know, we're ahead of budget. We're uh, actually uh, under budget, ahead of schedule, and it's coming along great. It should open in June, July of, 16, which is sort of an interesting thing. On Pennsylvania Avenue, we're opening just before they march down the street, right? But um, that's going to be a great project. So I have a lot of projects that I love. 
and uh, many, many buildings I've done over the years. I've always said, by the way, politically, uh, it's very hard for a person that's very, very successful to run for political office. Because, and you people know, you're very successful. And sometimes you have wars with people and you win. And you beat people badly. And you win big league and you have a lot of enemies and you develop a lot of enemies. And it's a lot easier if you run for political office and you haven't done a damn thing. <laughs> it's true. Because nobody comes out and says, oh, oh, oh. It's true. Unfortunately, so. Look, Obama did nothing except one house. He bought a house in Chicago, and that's questionable. But, but he never made deals or anything. And, and, you know, it's, and then you wonder, why is the world taking advantage of us? Why is it that every country that makes deals with us, whether it's Brazil or China or Mexico, Mexico is uh, brutal. Uh, what Mexico is doing to us, forgetting about the you know, people flowing in, uh, they, have, they are absolutely just making a fortune off the United States. And you wonder, why is it that we don't make good deals? Because we don't have people that have any concept of the deal. And it's very important. And that's why the country is essentially a poor country. I mean, we're a poor country. And we're losing, uh, you know, if this was a company, we'd be losing a tremendous amount of money and would be owing, you know, like soon 22. There's a very important number, and that's 22 trillion. When we hit that number, that's a, that's a number that's going to be very, very hard to come back from. 22 trillion. Who ever heard of the word trillion? Five years ago, you never even heard of the word trillion. And now it's like, yeah, we own, we owe, you know, we're, at, we're actually at 18 trillion. When we hit 22 trillion, that's a very bad number for this country. So, um, you know, you just sort of like you have to know what you're doing. And we have people that truly don't know what they're doing. So, um, you know, you'd mentioned trillion, and then I start thinking, you know, how much is enough? And, and for you, um, you know, what's next? What, uh, what is uh, Donald Trump going to do next? You've obviously been very successful in everything that you've touched, but, um, you know, are you, are you going for $5 billion, $10 billion? What's, what's up? Well, you know, Magazine did a story on me, and it was an interesting story, and it was headlined, Everything He Touches Turns to Gold. So I don't, I don't want to say that. Of course, they just did, but that's okay. But I would love to uh, devote all of that. I have always had the ability to make money. And I have always just, and, and even if a deal didn't go well, I made money. I figured how to, because the economy changed. I mean, the only deals I had that would have been problems are the economy changes. And when the economy changes, you have to fight, and you have to fight for your life, and you have to be very smart and very nimble. But I've always made money. And, you know, to a certain, and to, to a hundred percent extent, what I'd like to do is maybe, and it'll be dependent on what I ultimately decide, put that ability to work for this country. Because, you know, we have to be rich. If we're not going to be rich, we can't do the Social Security, we can't do the Medicare, the Medicaid, we can't do the lower taxes. We can't do all the things that everybody wants to have. I mean, I'm watching some of the Republicans where they want to cut the hell out of your Social Security, they want to cut the hell out of your Medicare and Medicaid, and there's no reason for that. Because we have a potentially, we have such potential in this country. I mean, it's easier than deals. It's easier than doing deals. That's the kind of potential we have. And I wouldn't want to cut Social Security. I want to stop the waste and abuse and the fraud. But Social Security should be, people earn their Social Security. and They shouldn't be cutting it down. And they want to cut it. Uh, they want to change years. They want to change ages. There are a lot of things you can do. So if I decide to do what I may very well decide to do, it will be to put my powers to work to make our country rich again, which in turn, we, and, and this is really important, this is how we're going to make our country great again. But we need a strong military. It's got to be a lot stronger because they're coming at us from every side. No, they're coming at us from every side. I mean, think of it as with the world changing so much and our military is getting weaker. They're getting weaker. They're cutting everything. They're cutting everything. Orders are being cut in half, and we should be going just the opposite. And we have to scare the world because, frankly, the world is, I mean, they're laughing at us now. Uh, you have ISIS, and they're cutting people's heads off on television. They have no fear whatsoever. It's amazing what they're doing. And uh, we don't even mention uh, Islamic terrorism. We don't mention anything. We just go along, and you see what's happening. I was uh, James Foley. I met his parents. I made a speech, actually, and he was one of the the uh, really incredible young man that, that, as you know, was beheaded. 
and viciously and violently. And I met his parents. I made a speech in honor of his parents uh, in New Hampshire. And it, it was an amazing evening for me to see when I heard about what kind of a young man he was and how nice his parents were. And they were devastated. I mean, this was probably a month and a half after the event of this horrible event. And they were devastated. And I mean, we just can't be allowing this stuff to happen. And they have no fear of this country whatsoever. So I would like to do something to make the country great again. And we'll see what ultimately happens. Um, how about, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, as far as the future, and, and uh, we're here talking about farmland today. And, uh, you know, I, I think I shot a note to your office that I was going to attempt to sell you a farm while you're here uh, okay. this week. Um, give, so, give me a good deal. <laughs> you want a good deal? I want a good deal. Um, so, could you see farmland in your future? It's, it's one do. of the largest asset classes in the world. And it is. And it's uh, right here, is, this is the hotbed, this is the place. Uh, no, I could see that. I mean, if, if the right. If the right, I'm not, I don't want to overpay. Am I wrong in saying that? I want to be nice, but I want to, I want to get a deal. <laughs> because I have to, up here, mentally, I have to. But no, I could see that happening very well. I mean, it was, it was big and beautiful, and you got it for the right price. I think it's a great, I think, it's, I think farms have a tremendous future. They've had some really, you know, it's very much of a boom bust. I mean, they've had some tremendous, tremendous times and some very horrible times. I mean, I know some farmers that went through hell, and uh, I, I know some, and some of those same farmers have also done very well. So you have a boom-bust mentality there. But uh, farms are something that certainly, if it was the right situation, I would absolutely be interested in investing. Well, if you had uh, been here for Dennis Gartman this afternoon, he was uh, rather depressing on farmland. Would everybody agree? Um, and so Doesn't mean maybe then I'll wait about a year, and we'll see. <laughs> You know, the last real opportunity would have been the 1980s, the 80s farm crisis, and I was born in 81, so I hear about it, but I, I didn't know what was going on at the time. But that was also a tough time for commercial real estate. That was tough, yeah. And so could you talk a little bit about that? Maybe what are some of the black swans that you see out there moving forward, and how are you prepared for yeah. what's next? Well, one of the things I've learned over the years is cash. Uh, cash is very important. One of the things that I don't like that I see happening that could be very bad for you folks is that China and, and many countries are devaluing big league. If you look at the euro, it's being devalued big league. Uh, you look at what's going on uh, in many, many countries, including Japan, but uh, many, many countries, they're devaluing their currencies really to a level that I cannot believe that we're allowing them to get away with it because you're going to have a hard time competing with all these devalued currencies. And you know, it sounds bad to say weak dollar and all that stuff, but the strong dollar has a lot of negative impacts. And one of the things is you can't sell your goods overseas, and you sell a lot in this room overseas. So uh, I hate to see that we are allowing them to get away with it. And I think they're doing it because they feel we're so weak right now, you know, with all the problems that the country has. Uh, in so many different ways, and that we're so weak that they just are doing things that they wouldn't have done a number of years ago. But you have a lot of devaluations going on, which is going to make it very, very tough for the people in this room to sell their goods to foreign countries. Look at the euro. I mean, the euro is crashing, and they want it to crash. They just did a billion dollar stimulus, and everyone thought it might be nothing, and it was a billion dollars, much more than the highest number. And that brought it way down. And, and uh, what, what it's going to mean is they're going to be able to start manufacturing and farming and doing lots of other things and selling it to us and selling it to other people. So I think we have to be very, very careful with all of these heavy devaluations going on throughout the world. Uh, so a personal question. When uh, my wife and I came out to your office, we were visiting with your staff. And, and uh, they started talking about your, uh, your children and then your grandchildren. And, I haven't heard much about your grandchildren, but it sounds like you're very proud of your family and just interested in what's next for the, the Trump family and maybe the grandkids. And the well, I've got seven grandchildren, beautiful grandchildren, and uh, Ivanka has two, and Don has five, and uh, they're, they're great, beautiful kids, and hopefully they'll be good. You know, a lot of people say, how did you bring up your kids? Because they seem to be good. You know, they see them on The Apprentice, and they seem to be good, and they are good, and they're good kids. 
and I hope I can say that in 10 years that we're together, believe me, because, you know, things can change quickly. But I always said, no drugs, no alcohol, no cigarettes. And I would drive, from the time they're two years old, they didn't even know what drugs were, they didn't know what alcohol, they didn't know what a cigarette was. But I'd look at Ivanka, I'd say, are you listening? She'd say, yes, Daddy. I'd say, no drugs. She goes, I know, no alcohol, no, see, you're driving me crazy. And I'd say it every week, I would have said it to them two or three times. And, you know, I had to get it. Because over the years, I've seen so many people where they're smart people, they're the most successful people in the country, they have very smart children, but the kids revert to drugs and alcohol. And, and I add the cigarettes, because, you know, it's obviously not a very healthy thing. But uh, I see so many people where they have really smart kids. They go to Wharton School, they go to Harvard, they go to, you know, great schools but they have a drug problem or they have an alcohol problem. And it's too competitive out there. It's very, very tough. And if you start, you know, if you, if you have a drug problem or an alcohol problem, you're just not going to compete. And, uh, and you're going to lead a terrible life. I mean, you, I've just seen such travesty. So I was always very strong at a very young age uh, with my children about the drugs and the alcohol and cigarettes. Um, so on a self-serving note here, um, you know, if you were going to give me advice as a young guy in the real estate business, uh, what would your advice be? Well, you have the perfect wife, beautiful wife, right? So you've done well there. That's so important. You know, it's, it's funny. Uh, I, I say that, but actually, it's so important. I've seen so many people, where the relate, men and women, where the relationship isn't right, and it's never gonna, they're never going to be successful. You know, I mean, I see it so much. I see it. Uh, there was a certain tennis player, and he was married to a woman who was driving him crazy. He was not good, and then he got married to the right one. Very famous player. I don't want to insult him by even saying who it is. But, but when he got married to the right one, all of a sudden he became the number one player. And uh, I always say the woman behind the man is so important. And by the way, the man behind the woman, likewise. But I've seen relationships that just work. And I've seen people that have great relationships, and then it's something doesn't work, and it's over. And the guy is no longer good at what he does. And you can't even explain it. Uh, and the same may be in the opposite case with the woman. So having a, a relationship is such an important thing. So, you know, what do I know behind closed doors? But it seems like it's a good relationship to me. <laughs> but I, I think that you have a lot of uh, energy, a lot of ambition. You're a strong guy. You're a smart guy. Look at this standing room only crowd. It's great. It's not easy to do. Well, thank you for that. Well, but whatever. <laughs> Much easier with Trump, right? I don't know. Uh, but, but I would just say you just keep on the same path. I know your company. I did a little research on your company. It's doing really well. And you just keep going down that path. What, uh, what did we not talk about? What do you want to say today? We have about 680 folks well, here. Well, we could it's... ask them, why don't we have a couple of questions from the audience? I find some of these people much more interesting than Steve, right? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Let's do that. Good question. Uh, you've had many, many successes, but you've, you must have had some failures, and what has it worked? And I sort of alluded to it before, Susan. You know, you have to learn from mistakes. Now, I like to learn from other people's mistakes because it's a lot cheaper. And it's the same kind of thing. And I do. I study other people's deals. I, I watch them. I watch their moves. I, I watch what went good, what went bad. I've, I've done a lot of that. You know, you have to learn from history. But I've had some where the markets changed and the markets crashed. And I've been able to make them into good deals. In, in one or two cases, I've made them into better deals that had the market stayed good. You have to be very nimble and smart and energetic. And you have to negotiate tough and smart. And you have to hope the banks are in a position where they are in enough trouble, because usually the world is crashing. In my world, usually the banks are in trouble with the developer. You know, it all sort of goes hand in hand. And some of the best deals I made were deals that shouldn't have been good deals. And you have to be able to recover. And I always say to people, never make a deal. Because I look, the biggest deal makers, the best guys, friends of mine, Carl Icahn and Kravis and all people that I know and like, and they made bad deals. They've had some really bad, bad deals. But what is real, no matter, so no matter how good you are, you're going to have bad deals. But I always say, never let a deal take you down. Don't bet. I've had a couple of friends where they built up a tremendous net worth, and then they bet the entire net worth on something and on a deal. 
And what happened is they lost everything. And they went bust. And, you know, take, take it a little bit slower. Do deals that won't take you down. Because believe me, you can think, I, I've had, a, I had one man, a friend of mine, great guy, and he had 30 years of success. And then he decided to do one massive deal. He bet the whole ranch on this one deal. And he was 100% sure it, it was good. I said, are you sure? He said, Donald, this is so good. And he went out and borrowed money and bought more of the company. Anyway, within two years, the whole company was bankrupt and he lost everything he had. And so I don't like to see uh, betting the ranch because you will have deals that you are so sure will be 100% good and they'll turn out to be disasters. And you'll likewise have deals you don't want, that you don't think that much of, they'll turn out to be great deals. So I don't, just, it's not worth it. Don't bet the entire ranch. So um, at dinner this evening, we'll have the three bankers that I work with joining us, and so I might have you help me out with some loan terms, I'll, perhaps. I'll make sure that they will treat you good. <laughs> you'll kick their ass. <laughs> Yes. So uh, lessons on casinos. So I was very lucky in Atlantic City. I made a lot of money in Atlantic City over the years. And about seven years ago, I left because I didn't like what was happening. The politicians really screwed it up. They built the convention center in the wrong location. They didn't fix the airport. They were building low-income housing all over the place. And there were much better locations. I'm a fan of low-income housing, but there were much better locations for the low-income housing than at the door of a casino. It was no good for the casino. It was no good for the people living in the housing. And I left about uh, seven years ago, before this uh, disaster. And again, I made so much money there. And I feel badly for Atlantic City. But I learned a lot. I like, I like the casino business, but it's highly competitive. And people are looking at it as a panacea. It's like now the whole country is becoming one big casino. So I don't. You know, you got to be very, very careful, because that's a business that can go badly. Look at Macau. Macau, all of a sudden, looked like it was going to be the end, and now all of a sudden, Macau is way down. Atlantic City is like, I mean, it's incredible. Every building is being closed in Atlantic City. So it can go badly, despite being casino. Caesars just filed for bankruptcy. I don't know if anyone heard that. You know, Caesars, one of the great casino companies, just filed for bankruptcy. I mean, officially filed for bankruptcy. So you never really know. As far as Savannah is concerned, I think probably uh, that's going to open up, and that's going to be an interesting place for me to be, if I'm not president. Be more interest. That's a good line. Well, it's a great, if I could buy any farm right now, uh, I don't think it would matter what kind. And I think I'd certainly do a little bit of research. And it wouldn't be that much research, because you know it doesn't take that much. It's an instinct. My deals are based on instinct. Uh, but I just, I, I mean, look, maybe my father was uh, in Germany. My mother was from Scotland. They were farmers. They, their parents were farmers. Maybe it's in my blood in that way. I just find it to be a beautiful thing and a beautiful business. I don't think it would matter. I'd want one that would be well located. I'd want great soils, obviously. Uh, but, and I'd want to do a little research on it. But it's, it's, it's such, it would be, I mean, honestly, except what I'm doing is so wild, but it, it would be such fun to do. I love the business. How many rounds of golf do I get to play? Much less than the president. <laughs> That I can tell you. And I play much better than he plays, too. Um, I like to try and get one round a weekend or two if I can, which is about the max, because I very rarely play during the week. But uh, one round. And, and golf is a great game. If the president used golf, I don't mind that the president plays a lot of golf. I think it's actually fine. But if he used that to play golf with Boehner and play golf with McConnell and play golf with all these guys. I mean, some of the best deals I've made is because of golf. I got friendly with people. I play on the course with them. They become they're my partner. We win the match for five dollars, and everybody's happy, and we're high fiving, and we you fall in love with these people. And honestly, if the president would use golf, and instead of playing with the same people or his friends from the past, which is also nice, but if he'd play with the people that he can't deal with, they'd all, I'll tell you, I, I, I have made relationships that I would have never made over lunch or over dinner. 
on a golf course. So it's a great tool. Golf is a great tool. I actually told the people at the Wharton School of Finance they should use golf as a business tool. But you have to play with people that maybe you might not want to play with so much. And you may love playing with them after you do it. But, uh, but I, it's really a great game. Yeah, the national debt, yeah. you said. Um, well, I, it's just the number is so staggering, no matter what numbers we look at, no matter by what level we compare it to. And of course, it's increasing. And actually, this year, it will increase less for certain reasons. But next year or the year after, it's going to increase big league, really big league. You know, you know there are certain structural reasons for that that won't change. So uh, I just view it as 20 trillion dollars, no matter by what standard, that's a tremendous amount of money. It's going to take a long time to get it paid back. You understand? Well, I think, uh, I think now we'd like to wrap it up. I have, I, I have two things we'd like to How's do. How's he doing, by the way? Is it brilliant? Huh? <laughs> Good job. Um, with your permission, I thought it would be fun. We're having dinner this evening, and uh, the governor and um, uh, a couple senators. Uh, we're going to have a really nice uh, dinner over at Harry Stein's barn. And um, I thought it would be fun. We auction a lot of farmland for clients. Okay. And I thought it would be fun if we auctioned off a spot to come join us at dinner to do sure. donate some money to a charity of your choice here. Okay. And uh, if you're up for that, I'd like to do that. Sure. Uh, we have a couple of the best auctioneers in the business in our company. Wow. And, and I don't know if this was uh, really uh, planned other than me just sitting here right now thinking about this. So I apologize. And then one other thing. Um, Becky, can you help me out? Uh, when, we were, when we were in Trump Tower, which is probably the most intimidating uh, place I've ever walked into in my life, we, uh, we were walking through Manhattan, and there's beautiful buildings everywhere you go, and you come upon Trump Tower, which is on the uh, corner of Central Park, and it's got a beautiful gold entrance to it, and you walk in, and there's Trump clothing, and there's Trump bar, and there's Trump restaurant, and... and uh, you know, I walked into that place and I thought, gosh, this is, this is not good. This is going to be a struggle for me. So I actually stopped by Trump Bar first just to get prepped for our meeting. <laughs> but um, anyhow, I, I really appreciate you being here. Again, we have the largest crowd we've ever had. We wouldn't have had it without you being here. Um, really appreciate it. When we were in your office, I was looking around and, and you had autographed footballs from Tom Brady and Tiger Woods and whatnot. And I thought, gosh, what could I give Mr. Trump um, that he doesn't already have for coming to Iowa as a gift? And I don't know if this is acceptable or not, but I thought there's one thing that Mr. Trump doesn't own that I think he should, and that's an uh, acre of Iowa farmland. Oh. So I, uh, I took the liberty of preparing a deed wow. to an acre of uh, farmland, and uh, I wanted to give that to you oh, as a that's gift. That's very good. I like that. And so now uh, when people say, do you own any farmland? Uh, now you've got the deed to an acre, so. Wow. Thank you. All right, so I think we'll do this uh, auction. So we're going to have a dinner immediately following this. And again, it's a very exclusive private dinner. And so uh, what would be a charity that you would donate, donate to if we... Uh, well, how about the American Cancer Society? Is that good? Okay. Yeah. Jeff, you doing that, Jared? He's doing this. Is mine on? Oh, yeah, it's on. Uh, Mr. Trump, if I may, this is my card. I'm the dirt dealer. Oh, good. And Mr. Brewer uh, was the only guy that beat me this year in sales. So if you would help me out, we could beat him. Okay, let's do it. And Mr. Trump, I'm the new guy on the block. I live in southern Iowa, so Steve likes to hire guys that hustle, so if you'd like to buy a farm ground, you have a call me. Good. And we have uh, Mr. Zelmer helping us here, Andrew Zelmer. And we have uh, Darren Becker over here helping us out. So um, I'm going to start out. We're going to do a little tag team here um, because I told Jared, I said, I'll never get to do this again in my life, and he's younger than me, and he'll probably get to do this again, so we've got to cut the tag team. Uh, so what the deal is, um, I'm sure most of you have been to auctions before. Uh, basically, if you bid too much, we'll tell you. Isn't that right, Matt? Matt, you want to work the money for us? Okay, okay, we'll take your money. So anyway, uh, we're going to take bids on this. It's a dinner, two, two people, I assume, yep. Uh, two people uh, going to donate it to charity. I think that's a great deal. So uh, bid often, kind of like they do in Chicago. Sure. Bid early and often. 
It's like you vote. All the money going to the American Cancer Society, too, so. Okay, I get out of your way here. You don't want the picture of my legs, trust me. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. I need, yes, yes sir. We got 500 and now 750. 750 and now 1,000 now 1250. What do you say? 1250 and now 1500. What do you say? 1750 and now 2000. What do you say? 2000 and now 2250. What do you say? 2250. Now 500. What do you say? 2500. What do you say? 2500. What about 7 and a half? 27 and a half. 2500. Now 7 and a half. Hey, Jeff. Do they know who's going to be there tonight? It's not me, but he's taking my place. The governor, Lieutenant Governor Donald Trump will be there tonight. Folks, bid now, bid often. 25, and now 2750. 2500, now 750, and now 3000. What do you say? 3000, well, I'm in back here. 2750, and now 3000. And I'm, I'm going to let you take over now. I On 3000, there, 3250. On 3000, bid, you're going to be 32, bid now, 55, 35, bid 3500, where? On 32, bid there, 55, 35, bid 3500. I got 35, got to be 750. Now 4000, where? On 37, bid there, now 4 to bid, 4 to buy, bid now, bid often. 4,250 and 4,000 there now 4,250. Who's can say they bid with a uh, Donald Trump here? 4,000, 4,250, 4,250 now 55, 40 get a body to 4,500 now 750. I'm 4,500 riding with Jeff, gotta be 750 and 4,500 to get your hands held. Has anybody here never been to an auction before? Raise your hand. <laughs> Donald, have you ever been to an I'll auction before? I'll, I'll tell you what I uh, If they get up to $10,000. We'll let them come to Mar-a-Lago in Palm Beach, Florida, man and wife or whoever, two people, which is considered the greatest club anywhere in the world, and I think you'll love it. Uh, so if they get up to 10,000, we'll have the dinner tonight, but we'll also let them come a weekend at Mar-a-Lago. Okay. Folks, you heard it from the man himself. I'll, I'll drive. You'll drive. I'll we drive. take the Viper. We take the limo. We'll take the Steve, limo. Steve, can we take drive. the limo? There you go. Right there, 45, 750. I'm 45, and I'm going to be 750. Now you heard it, 750. Now 5,000 where? I'm 4750, we got to be 5,000. I'm going to bid 5,000 where? I'm 4750, riding with Jeff, 5,000. 50 do 50. I'm 5,000 there, 50 do 50. I'm going to bid 50 do 50. Now 5, 5, 5,500 where? I'm 5250 with Steve Burr, got to be 55. Guys, let's beat Steve. 50 do 50. Now 5, hey, 5, 5,500. How many times do you get this chance? Never in your Once life. Once in a lifetime. Once in a lifetime. Once in a lifetime. 52, 50, 500 where? And 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 500 where? And 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 500. Donald, you're tearing around Mick. Let's go. 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, Ten thousand dollars. We got it straight away. Ten thousand bid. Got to be ten five. On ten thousand five. Got to be ten five. On ten thousand straight away. Hard money. Got to be ten five. Your turn, Matt. Let's go. Ten thousand straight away. Got to be ten five. Ten thousand now. Ten five. Anybody else want to bid ten five? Ten five. We're out. Ten thousand straight away. Steve, what about you? Randy, we're out. I'm 10,000 straight away. Hard money got to be 10,5 where? I'm 10,000 there now. 10,5. 10,5. 11,000. Let's have an auction here. One I'm more 10, time. I'm 10,5 and there. Got to be 11. One more time. Bid 11,000. Donald, would you stand up here and help us out? We're going to raise some good money here. 10,5. 11,000 where? I'm 10,5. Got to be 11,000. Spend another 11, 500. 000. You're already 10, spent 5. 10. Right side. Got to be 11,000. One, One more, more time. time. Hang right in there, sir. Got to be 11,000. You're getting a good deal. I'm the auctioneer. Just hey, look at me. We'll right there, 10 5. Got to be 11,000. On 10 5, right side, got to be 11,000. What about you? Got to bid 11,000? 11,000? 11,000? You got to be with this guy right here. 11,000? 11,000? 10 5. Right side, got to be 11,000. Besides that, he's going to be a brewer. <laughs> we could take a read. We could, uh, is it the joke time? Folks, we're going to move okay, on go. here. We've got to move on. We're at 10 5, asking 11,000 going once. 10,000. 11,000. Now 500. I'm 11,000 there. Got to be 5 5. Get 11 5. Would have been 11 5. One more time. We're going to move on, folks. We've got to carry on. 11,000. That'd be 11 5. Hey, 11,000 there. Now 5 to bid. 5 to buy. 11 5. 11 5. 12,000. 12,000. 13,000. 13,000. I'm 12,000. It's going to be 13. One more time. Bid 13,000. 13,000. About 14. Bid 14. One. Hang right in there, sir. You've got to be 14,000. I'm 13 there. Got to be 14. I'm 14. One more time. Bid 14,000. 14 going once. 14 going twice. I'm 13. Got to be 14. Folks, thank you very much. Sold at $13,000. Give him a big round of applause. 
standing up over there. We'll get with you later. Ken, Ken, we you're gonna you're gonna close this up, or am I closing this up? All right, guys. Uh, so uh, social hour outside here. Thank you, Mr. Trump. Again, record crowd. Thank you.